Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2018 premier auction. Specifically today, an Enfield model of 1880 Mark I interchangeable revolver. This is the first Enfield revolver actually adopted by the British military, and let's be honest, it's probably the ugliest. Uh, this thing has character, shall we say. Now this was based, it was originally designed to replace the Adams patent revolver that the British military had been using. Uh, they wanted something that would be a little faster, something that would have a little more power to it. And uh, rather than adopt, say, a Webley revolver, which these were starting to become available at the time, um, a Webley break action revolver, um, the British military decided that, or rather the Enfield uh, factory decided that they could come up with their own revolver for the service and it'd be better and it'd be great. And they des that this is what they came up with, and they designed this largely based on a patent, or a couple of patents, from the 1870s by a guy named Owen Jones. He was originally Welsh, emigrated to the United States where he lived in Philadelphia, and he patented a mechanism for a revolver extractor mechanism. Actually fairly similar to the Merwin and Hulbert system, at least in practice. Uh, although interestingly his original patents actually included an automatic ejection system. The, the British didn't use that element, but what they did want was a gun that, where you could extract all the cases at once, easily. So uh, the Enfield factory designed this, it was adopted in 1880, it was then fairly quickly uh, retrofitted, updated, we'll talk about the changes in a moment, uh, it was updated to the Mark II pattern in 1882. In 1887 a safety mechanism was added to it. It was discovered that you could actually fire this pretty easily by either dropping it or hitting the back of the hammer. That uh, became a bit of a scandal and really became obviously known in 1886. There was a, a British sailor on a ship named the Flying Fish uh, who went ashore uh, to place a survey marker, and on his way back he gets into the little rowboat sort of uh, thing to get back out to his ship. And he stops to bend over to look at something, and his Enfield pistol, uh, revolver, falls out of its holster, hits the floor of, hits the, the bottom of the boat, uh, on the hammer, gun discharges, and a bullet goes right through his head and kills him, dead right on the spot there. And this led to a major, well, led to an investigation by the British military, and they retrofitted most of these guns, or at least a lot of them, with an additional safety mechanism that would prevent the gun from firing like that. Um, that is perhaps the most notable thing that happened to this pistol during its service life, uh, because it didn't last a whole lot longer than that. So anyway, we'll touch on uh, what replaced it later on. For now, let's take a look at what this weird funky hinge thing is actually doing. I do want to touch first on the cartridge that this pistol was designed for. They didn't actually have the cartridge ready when the pistols were first going into manufacture. So these guns could actually use the 450 Adams cartridge. Once they did get the Enfield cartridge into production, uh, it was it, th these are basically all 455 caliber uh, projectiles. The specific loading for this was a 600 or a 265 grain, that's 17.2 grams. A bullet traveling at a whopping 600 feet per second, or 183 meters per second. This was still a fairly anemic cartridge. Certainly, if you compared it to something like, you know, the Colt Peacemaker, the 45 caliber Colt cartridge, uh, which was available at well, even a few years before this in the United States, that was a much more powerful revolver cartridge, and that would be part of the problem with these guns. Um, the, the British would go on to slowly kind of step up the power of these cartridges, not by a lot, but a little bit each time. Anyway. Now, the reason for all of this weird looking assembly here is because this whole thing pivots right here on the front. Uh, it's a top brake revolver, sort of, not really in the way that we're used to, because the cylinder remains on its axis pin the whole time and attached to the rear of the frame. What this is designed to do is pull the cylinder forward off of the cartridges. As I said in the beginning, this is kind of like the uh, Merwin and Hulbert system. We have uh, the extractor here isn't really an extractor, this is what holds uh, the rims of the cartridges in place. So when you open the gun up like this, all of the cartridge cases remain flush against the back face of the frame here, 
And if you have fired the case, it will be shorter than this open length, and the empty case will fall out. If, let's say, you've only fired a few of the rounds, let's say you've fired three, and you have three empty cases, when you open this thing up, the, the live full, you know, the, the unfired rounds because they will be longer, because they still have bullets in them. And the bullets will still be held in the front, or in the rear, of the cylinder here. So the live cartridges will stay in the gun, the empty cases will fall out. At least, that's the idea. Uh, one of the problems with this is that the bottom case kind of always got stuck in there, because it's sitting in between you know, the, the, the star here and the bottom of the frame. And so you, all, all accounts of this gun uh, mention that you, you basically open it up like this, and then you have to kind of shake it off on its side or push that bottom uh, case out. So it did extract everything at once, but not really perfectly. Now in order to load it, also like the Merwin and Hulbert, uh, you have a loading gate here on the side. So you would open that up, you've got a little cutout here to allow cartridges to go in, and you put one in, rotate, put one in, rotate, put one in, etc. So you load it one by one, but you do get to extract all of them at once, mostly. I mentioned that extra safety that was added in about 1887. This gun does have it added. That S uh, indicates that the, the new safety has been added. And what that simply means is that if you have the hammer cocked, you can't just hit the hammer and have it discharge. That's a, a very good thing to have improved the gun with. These are, by the way, double action revolvers. So you can fire in double action, or you can manually cock the hammer and fire in single action. There aren't a whole lot of markings on these. The Mark II guns would have Enfield logos here, but this one does not. Uh, really the one substantial... well, we have a couple markings we can show you. Probably the most important one is the serial number here on the front of the frame, 9100. We have an N on the back of the grip. That indicates Navy usage, as opposed to Army or anybody else. And we also have this double broad arrow. Um, a single broad arrow proof means government property. When guns were sold out of service, as surplus or for any other reason, uh, they, were, they, they stamped a second uh, facing broad arrow there. So when you see that, that sort of star stamping, that indicates that the gun was sold from military property into private property. Now I mentioned in 1882 they made some changes. We can briefly go over those. Unfortunately I don't have a, a Mark II here to show you like side by side, but uh, we'll start with the front sight. This is the Mark I pattern. They decided to make this uh, semicircular instead of kind of shark fin-like. The idea was it would be less likely to catch uh, when being drawn out of a holster. So that's a Mark I sight. Uh, the top strap here was redesigned a bit on the, uh, on the Mark II. It's uh, a little lower profile, comes down here a little smoother. The grips on the Mark II were changed to get rid of the checkering. They just had smooth grips. Now some of the more important stuff. On the Mark I, the cylinder spins freely uh, until you cock the hammer, and then it's locked in place. This one's a little loose because it's like 140 years old. Um, however, this was deemed to potentially be a problem. They were worried that, you know, what if you fired a couple of rounds and then reholstered the revolver, and then somehow, you know, the, the cylinder shifted while it was in your holster. Now, now, when you draw the pistol to fire, you've still got some live ammo in there, but maybe it will have rotated to the point that you have a fired case under the hammer. So on the Mark II, they added uh, basically a, a, a lock mechanism so that the cylinder couldn't rotate unless you had the loading gate open. Because of course when the gate's open, you need to rotate the cylinder to load it. Um, they also added a safety whereby when the gate was open, you couldn't cock the hammer. So. With this one, you can fire the gun all you like with the loading gate open. The Mark II uh, changed that. And you can actually... one of the easier ways to spot a Mark II gun is it actually has another screw down here, which I believe is to hold some of the bits for that extra uh, lock work in place. So we have just one big screw here. The Mark II has a second. And I think that pretty much covers it. Um, I do want to point out, while this thing had its faults, there are some definite, you know, good design elements to it. So if we look at the back of the cylinder here, you can see that the case, the, the chambers, are fairly deeply recessed. When this thing was in battery, the, the whole case head was fully 
uh, enclosed inside the cylinder. And that meant, uh, first off, it was stronger. You were less likely to have a ruptured case. If you did have a ruptured case, you were less likely to get, you know, catastrophic gas leakage. Um, th- this was a good thing. This, the idea of a recessed case head was definitely a good thing. Now, this sort of extraction system, yeah, I don't know that that's the, the greatest thing ever designed. But it certainly does make for a cool collector's piece today, that's for sure. Overall, no one was really all that happy with these Mark I and Mark II Enfield revolvers. People thought they were too heavy, they were clumsy, um, there were some questions about the reliability and accuracy, but it's hard to tell how real those were, or if they were just people who didn't like the gun and were embarrassed to have to carry them. Whatever the ultimate cause, uh, production ended in 1889, because 1887 or so, the British government decided to adopt a Webley top break revolver instead, to start replacing these Enfields. And in 1889, they were getting enough of the Webleys in that they stopped making the Enfields. So these had a a service life of really less than 10 years. Um, They were used by the British Army, by the Royal Navy, and as you saw, this one is a Royal Navy gun. Uh, They were also used by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who probably had them longer than anyone else. They were stuck with these things until about 1911. and, and then that's it. They never actually made a civilian production version of this. That's one of the interesting things about the Webley revolvers, is Webley was a private company, and it would make a government pattern revolver, and then it would quite happily sell the exact same model, and perhaps a fancier version, and versions with some extra little features. They'd sell all those on the civilian commercial market. So there are a lot of Webleys out there. The Enfield was made by Enfield, the military owned factory, um, or the government owned factory. And so they didn't actually make a commercial version of this gun. And for that reason, these are rather scarcer than a lot of the other British uh, types of revolvers that were around, you know, in the late 1800s. So Mark I guns in particular are rather rare. Uh, The Mark I only existed for about two years before it was replaced by the Mark II. So this is a really cool one to get a chance to take a look at. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you're interested in this sort of thing, make sure to take a look at Rock Island's uh, catalog page. They have, uh, well, of course, this one's coming up for auction in September of 2018. Thanks for watching.